Uh, one of the things we do at, at Byline, we have two journalists who are whistleblowers who are on our investigations team. One of them is uh, Graham Johnson, who is here tonight, told the truth about phone hacking. We also had John Ford recently coming forward. John Ford, a blagger of 15 years, Sunday Times, getting people's bank records. He came forward to Byline because we believe stories actually come from whistleblowers. And here are two amazing whistleblowers, as you know. Uh, I'm going to get one thing out of the way and talk to Shamir because whistleblowers are always targeted. Chris was targeted many years for legal threats. Um, there has been a little bit of personality attack on him, but it, it's you know his story is quite irrefutable. Shamir, who I've known now for probably a couple of months, was I think outrageously and viciously attacked by Number Ten on Friday. I don't. I don't know if Shamir wants to talk about this, but I'm going to give him the opportunity, but I'm going to preface it with what happened. Dominic Cummins, who was the key figure in Vote Believe, that Shamir was about to blow some interesting, whistly information on, wrote in his blog about Shamir having a relationship with a senior member now of government of the Vote Believe campaign, effectively outing him. He was, I think he received the lawyer's letter because he removed that sentence. Later that night, number 10 issued a statement saying that Shamir, who was I think 22, 22 at the time, had had a relationship with somebody in his mid-30s, a very powerful member of government, and effectively, for the first time ever, as far as we know, outed somebody against their will. Somebody who, by the way, uh, has family in Pakistan, where he was born, where that, I think, is a crime. So I, I, I don't want this, this is called a dead cat. Uh, we have Boris's father here, who's a great man, but his son came up with this great phrase, the dead cat. What do you do when it changes the subject of a story? You throw a dead cat on the table. It's disgusting, everybody hates it, but if we talk about the dead cat. Um, Shamir, what, what's the last weekend been like? Um, um, where do I start? Uh, when did you first hear about what Cummings had said and what well, um, obviously people were like, oh, you know, he's, people, I think it was just his book where, where, where people were tweeting about his blog. And so, you know, I went through his blog and I was like, okay, cool, cool. 8,000 word blog. 8,000 word blog. And I was just sort of skimming through it because there wasn't much, anything new in there. And then I just sort of came across the statement. And that's when I contacted the great Tamsin. Um, Tamsin Allen, great lawyer. <laughs> I don't know what to do about this. And she, and sort of we, that's when I started pan, panicking. I, you know, I'm, I, I don't really want to go into details, but like, that's when I started panicking. But then I was like, it's only Don Cummings' blog. No one reads that. That's <laughs> 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 like, And so I was, I was, I, I was mildly panicking. I was like, okay, it's okay. These, you know, these, this was, I, I expected it. I never thought it would actually happen, but a part of me was like, maybe, but they wouldn't stoop that low. Um, but it was only in the middle of the, it was like late in the evening that same day when the New York Times called me and said, can you comment on the statement that we've been sent by number 10? And I said, what, what are you talking about? And he was like, well, uh, allegations about you being in a relationship with Stephen Parkinson. And that's where my heart dropped when I was like, you know, couldn't contain it. It couldn't be contained. Yeah, but I was, I was going to swear that I was containing myself. <laughs> but, um, uh, but that's when I, my heart dropped and I said, okay, fine, okay, cool. And that's when we sent out the, that's when we asked the New York Times to forward us the email. And it literally said, it was from a number 10 email with statement official. And with, here's the quote, that's, here's the statement that Stephen Parkinson sent out. And so that's when Times has sent out, I don't know if everyone here has read the, statement that I wrote, but, you know, that's when, like, it, it was, you know what, I'm, it was, it was fucking shit, like, I'm not, statement said, I'm, just to spare you the, uh, like, still a bit, I'm having to say that again, that you, I mean, you had to come out to your family, yeah, I came out to my mum day before yesterday, and that's something, like, see, I hate talking about it, because it, like, gets, um, and also, Family in Pakistan had to be warned, had to be given protective measures because. So yeah. this is a very, very painful way to attack a whistleblower. 
I personally think it's because it's the first time this has happened. Official statement number 10. That should be, I think it's probably in contravention of anti-discrimination law. And I hope that this never happens again. This is the worst way to attack a whistleblower, whatever your political motives. Shamir wrote a very generous rider to his legal statement was that, that Stephen one day would regret doing this. We don't know the pressures on Stephen Parkinson. We don't know why he did it. It was clearly. It was clearly designed to shut Shamir up. And this very young man, and it's not going to be shut up. So Shamir, take a moment. You know, he knew. He knew that I was that I wasn't out to my mom. And have like all I the only thing I've been doing is So this is the person. Okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Sorry. I'm just being a drama queen. Um, <laughs> like wasn't supposed to happen, I swear to God. Um, you know, I have not, you know, I, I'm, I'm literally, I go about my life like I don't have any hate towards anyone, I, I don't. The only reason I did this was because of the shit that Darren went through. And like, explain Darren Grimes co-founded Believe with you, which yeah. is the youth and more liberal. Thing. You know, Darren Grimes has been sort of like attacked by the media for this. And to just sort of see how low these people will stoop to just to make sure that they win, just to make sure that they're, that they're the, the things that they did. And you know, the sort of, the way that they use, Darren more than so than me, um, is, is like, this is how low they will stoop. It's just, it's not relevant. Like it's not, how is it, how is my relationship with Stephen Parkinson relevant to the stuff that I'm talking about? Well, that's the point, isn't it? It's not relevant and it's the politics of personal destruction yeah shuts you up and distracts. Exactly. So and this is what all the publications started talking about, you know, from, it doesn't matter from what site, but like the, the homophobic vitriol, oh, he, you know, he was at Sing, and I don't even want to talk about it, oh, he was at a gay event at, at Harry Cole tweeted out a tweet, how could he be a surprise this gay, because he went to an LGBT yeah, event. The Prime Minister was there, so the Prime Minister gay as well, like, I don't, I don't understand that. You know, there's this sort of logic, like there's, there's a thing called being a straight ally or a, an ally of LGBTQ rights. And that's why I've, what I have proudly called myself is up till now an ally of the LGBTQ community because that's, it sort of protected both me from expressing my support of the LGBTQ community as well as protecting my family. And protects LGBT people who are always supporting. And, they, and he, he, number 10, and it wasn't just Stephen Parkinson, it was number 10, Dominic Cummings and Stephen Parkinson that stripped me of what was the most important conversation for me to have with my mother and my sisters and my family you know and now Pakistani news is reporting on it you know like the whole world is reporting on it because number 10 and Can you have, I mean, it's not your home your home is here but you have relatives of course, of course I have my you know my dad lives there and my so can you go back safely to Pakistan then? you know what like I, I don't even want to think about it because it's something that's like I don't want to think about it you know I don't want to think about it well. but like Sorry, guys. I have to be addressed. I don't mean to like break down like that, but um, yeah. But this, you know what? I t I came out to my mom, and she said, uh, she said to me, Shami, I love you, no matter what. They're just doing it to shut you up. Don't, don't stop. And I was like, thanks, mama. <laughs> So it must be made clear at the beginning, because this has been described as a Ramona's paradise, a place where people who don't believe in Brexit are coming up with false reasons why the, the referendum might have been gained, illegal or illicit things done. Uh, we'll get to this in a moment, but Shamir is a stalwart believer in leaving the EU. So as emerged our last conversation, uh, he might have changed his mind a bit, but certainly in 2016, was Chris, weren't you? Chris Wanda, you, 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 at that time, you were a believer in the I'm a Eurosceptic. I don't, I don't hide that. I, I'm, you know, just because I have pink hair and a nose ring doesn't mean that I, I, I can't call into question the democratic legitimacy, uh, you know, of, of the European Union. 
So what's happened since the last week, last Tuesday we've met? There have been certain, I'm giving you a chance to rebut, because I'm not Jeremy Paxman, I like listening to people and hear what they have to say, rather than interrupt them and contradict them. Um, various things have been said about your account. Now, one of the important things has been said, it's just my, what Cambridge Analytica did, it's just micro-targeting. The Obama campaign did it. Everybody's been doing it. It doesn't work. That's why they paid all this money for it. Uh, that's why everybody wanted to work with Cambridge Analytica. But somehow what you were different doing was no different from what campaigns have been doing for years. Would you like to comment on that? There's a, <clears throat> there's a fundamental difference between um, targeting a, a political message online and disinformation, targeting disinformation. And what Cambridge Analytica does is it starts rumor campaigns and it spreads fake news and disinformation to warp people's perception of what's actually happening in the world. And that's fundamentally different. You just so yeah. you know, when, when you know, the, it's stupid to, to compare Cambridge Analytica with the Obama campaign. I'm sorry. The, you know, when when the Obama campaign sent out messaging, you it was readily apparent that this is a message from the Obama campaign. It was about an issue. There was a common acceptance of what is true and factual, uh, and 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 the messaging was about you know an ideological perspective on on you know and, and an argument. Um, Cambridge Analytica, as it admits to doing in the undercover. Uh, you know, it f focuses on trying to warp people's perception of what is real by presenting them with false information uh, to, 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 to coerce and, and mislead voters, uh, to walk them down a path so that they start to believe things that aren't necessarily true. You had a brilliant analogy um, last week, for people who missed last week, was going back to say like a combat operation, an information operation, you want to get an Iraqi general <coughs> to go up the wrong hill where there were fake tanks to be caught in an ambush, uh, and that basically Cambridge Analytica could do that kind of information operation at an individual level. Yeah, like so that. you know, you have to remember that Cambridge Analytica, uh, the parent company, is SCL Group, which is a military contractor. And when you look at, you know, you can't, in a, in a, in a conflict situation, you can't use a, a marketing approach to combat ISIS, right? You know, if I'm an American general or a British general, and I, get, you know, I can't go to ISIS and say, and, and market, you know, a region, or say, you know, it, use some sort of marketing approach, you should walk over this hill because of, you know, it's green pastures and it's wonderful because I'm not a credible source of information to ISIS because I'm a general that is fighting them. So, the idea of uh, you know gaining informational dominance in in, in conflict in conflict areas is that I can since I cannot persuade my opponent to do something I need to inject information into the various channels that they are consuming so that they start to 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 think themselves that they should move over this hill uh, and so the veracity of that information isn't you know a priority it's it's changing your opponent's perception. So that they, you know, you know, act in a particular way that you can exploit. Um, and all Cambridge Analytica does is look at what kinds of mental heuristics or vulnerabilities does a person have, you know, in, in this case, a, a voter, and and programmatically inject information into that person's, you know, information sphere. Um, and, and, and you know, more tangibly, that just means that your your target audience is seeing. Uh, information on on blogs or on, on fake news sites that leads them to start thinking that certain things are happening when they turn on the channel when they look at you know a a mainstream news site and they don't they don't see what they're seeing online they start to distrust that mainstream media because they feel like they're being that the information is being kept from them and once you once you establish that distrust you know you that is when you've you've primed a voter uh, or primed a person to, you know, then engage with, you know, an alt-right campaign or an alt-right ideology. So just going, because we couldn't talk about Brexit last week, well, for various reasons, this, this story is coming up. And just to comment a little bit on the difference between the Obama campaign and the Trump campaign, my memory was the Obama campaign, even its content, how it's micro-targeted, was yes, we can not lock her up. Um, so it seemed a slightly more optimistic meaning. You spoke very interestingly about the why it's called Cambridge Analytica and last week the Steve Bannon was a fake office was created in Cambridge 
as an information operation on him because he liked the idea of Cambridge and when he's putting this money in, they, that's why the, the name came. But you think Steve Bannon always looked to the UK in some way as part of the Spain last week, a kind of multiple year long project, a culture war using information technology to change the political landscape. So why was Britain important to Bannon? Well, Britain, Britain serves as a, as a cultural leader for the English speaking world. So, uh, you know, particularly for Americans, the, the sort of American concept of, of, of British people as sort of the well-educated, calm, rational, sober people who wear dinner jackets and go to eat, right? Um, and so if you can um, you know, instill a, a, a populist movement in the UK, in a way, you can sort of culturally sanitize that, that populism because if the Brits can do it, then we can do it in America and it's not as crazy as it sounds. Did you recognize that early on, that, that he would be targeting Britain in any way? Yeah, that's why, that's why Breitbart set up in London. And set exactly up. the same time. Yeah. Rahim Kassam was recruited at exactly the same time in 2013 as Cambridge Analytica was set up. Yeah. Uh, and he obviously saw the UK as a target. Now, Rahim Kassam was also speechwriter for Nigel Farage and was going to run for UK. You, did you know this at the time? That Do you know Bannon's proximity to Farage? Um, well, I mean, Bannon, Bannon made quite clear that he would, he was whenever he would come to London and meet with us, always on the schedules meeting people from UKIP. Um, so, so, so UKIP, you know, he set his eyes on UKIP and, you know, Mercer also has a lot of connections to UKIP. Um, and, and Shall I explain those connections? So, um, Robert Mercer's lawyer is a guy called Matthew Richardson, who's also yeah. in Cambridge in 2013 at the Young Britain's Foundation Conference, which is very interesting if you look that, that, that organization up. And he was recruited Mercer's lawyer and as, I think, treasurer of UKIP. Yeah, yeah um, and so, you know, both Robert Mercer and, and Steve Bannon, um, you know, care deeply about the future of UKIP and also more broadly, can you instill a populist movement in the UK? Not necessarily for the benefit of the UK, more so for creating a cultural proof point for America. So that's what you're, you were involved at a sort of digital granular level, but in a culture war. You always knew it was a culture war to sort of tip these countries to, that you always said, you quoted, um, Bannon quoting uh, Breitbart himself that politics is downstream from culture. Yeah. So and, and, that, and, that's, and that's where and that's where Britain comes in because if you if you extend you know this idea of politics flowing from culture, you know Britain is an is an important cultural leader in the English speaking world. So it's obviously you know absolutely important if you're trying to capture culture that you capture you know the cultural leader you know in that culture which is Britain. During that the two years you were actually. Because basically, I, I don't think it's unfair to say this was the, the mind behind Cambridge Analytica, not if, the soul. If, yeah, if I was, <laughs> I was the mind, but not necessarily. Not the soul, not the moral soul, but the sort of the calculus, the kind of brilliance of the digital campaign. Did, did you see, obviously nobody knew there was going to be an EU referendum until Cameron's re-elected in 2015. So did, did you see what the operations were in the UK, or did you see precursors to Brexit, things that were going on, meetings with you? Well, there, there were definitely precursors. I mean, we, we, we would, you know, I'd be invited to, uh, you know, go on to conference calls, and, you know, people from UKIP would be on those calls. Even, even, even when the, the calls themselves weren't about UKIP itself, you know, the various, you know, subcontractors and whatnot that we were looking at in the United States, you still have people from the UK who were, you know, senior UKIP members uh, participating in, in, in some of that planning. So, uh, you know, UKIP, he, U, UKIP was around from the very beginning uh, of the company. And I mean, worth saying that um, it's on record. I think has been contradicted that um, Nigel Bannon is such a. Oh, sorry, Nigel Bannon. <laughs> <laughs> they are brothers. <laughs> Nigel Farage is such a fan of Steve Bannon that he bought him, or got him copied, a photograph of Napoleon, that Steve Bannon as Napoleon, which he hangs somewhere in, in, in his office. So this leads us to an important revelation, and you've got some new news on this, um, is that obviously, we're just about Leave EU at the moment, we'll get to vote Leave and Shamir. Leave EU have been very adamant, despite Aaron Banks and um, 
Andy Wigmore tweeting to me and Carol and various other people. Yes, we we you know we thought did most of our analysis. It was Cambridge Analytica that won it for us. They're brilliant. In fact, Cambridge Analytica were at the launch of uh, LeeVU. Cambridge Analytica boasts on their site they've helped turbocharge LeeVU. Now they never work together. They never work together at all. But a, did they work with AIQ during the campaign? AIQ. So we the, the thing. So first of all, Brittany Kaiser, who you're referring to, who was at the, the launch of, of LeeVU, who, who was also uh, a director at Cambridge Analytica, uh, last week actually finally conceded that yes, they did do work for, that they being Cambridge Analytica did do work for LeeVU. Uh, so it should be, the, the reason why they first boasted about it, then abject denial, was because it was the first time that Cambridge Analytica had worked on a project where potentially unlawful activity happened, uh, where they couldn't just leave the country after it happened. And they, they came to the realization that actually, oh wait, we did it on our home turf and we are actually subject to the jurisdiction of this country. As, as the you know, ICO raids show, uh, you know, they, they have to actually comply with British law, which is why they backtracked on all of the work that they did for, for LeeVU because it wasn't compliant, because it wasn't declared. LeeVU didn't declare the work that Cambridge Analytica did, which means, by extension, Robert Mercer funded projects that interfered with Brexit. Well, they, they would, just to give the other side, but they say they, they had a pitch to them for 40000 Andy Wigmore was slightly unclear who paid that bill. They said it wasn't us. I, I leave you. So there was a lot of controversy to give the other side. They claim they weren't involved. But your allegation is, and, and surely given Bannon and Mercer's, and, and Bannon and Farage's friendship, that a lot of the materials, a lot of the underlying machinery of the Leave EU campaign was somehow inherited from Cambridge Analytica. Would you say, would, would there be data? You have an interview about AIQ, but would there be data in the Leave EU analytics which would show where well, they I mean, got? They, they, they've, I, I've, I've seen invoices where Cambridge Analytica was actually working for UKIP. So, yeah. so UK, you know, you know, sure they say, well, we didn't work for Leave EU or da 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 da, but you know, they also did work for UKIP. I've seen invoices that show that they've worked for UK. Um, you know, and, and also something else that I've seen is is you know Andy Wigmore's company, Elden Insurance, you know, talking about uh, targeted advertising uh, on Elden Insurance letterhead, uh, talking about LeeVU targeted advertising. So you know, why is it that Elden Insurance was producing you know internal reports for LeeVU talking about internal LeeVU? Uh, you know, re response rates for their advertising when it's an insurance company. Uh, so know, the two so issues here worthy of investigation, put it this way. One is donations in kind. So imagine, I'm not saying this necessarily happened, but for, that Robert Mercer and Steve Bannon gave over all their great analytical machines and micro-targeting to leave you for free. I'm not saying this necessarily this happened. But imagine they did. Uh, that would be a donation in kind and should be costed. I think the other thing, and we'll get will be relevant to uh, vote leave, is foreign donations. Now, I think it's banned in the states. It's certainly illegal here, and certainly uh, whether it's illegal or not, we need to know who's acting in our elections. And if there's any indication that that Cambridge Analytica, which by the way was an American registered company, and major shareholders, Merce and Banner, uh, were interfering in British elections, we need to know. Um, can we? Just to segue to um, Shamir and the vote leave issue, uh, just talk about AIQ, because I think people are a bit confused about this. AIQ took half the spend of vote leave. Is that of the 40%? 40, 40%. 40 and of all, were they involved with leave EU as well? No, they, so AIQ, so Cambridge Analytica did work for leave EU. And aggregate IQ did work for vote leave. 40% of vote leave spending went to AIQ, okay? So this this small, random company on an island on the west coast of Canada, uh, you know, with like eight or 10 employees, took 40% of vote leave's expenditure. You so, know why, because you, you know these companies. Well, yeah, because I helped set it up. So aggregate IQ uh, was set up to service Cambridge Analytica projects, it acted as the de facto software development team for Cambridge Analytica. Um, and, you know, 
when you when you look at, for example, what Gizmodo released today is actually you know tangible proof uh, in terms of code banks and and and, and, and developer What's a code bank? Explain what a code bank. Is. The, co the the actual codes uh, and, and developer comments on software on software development um, because AIQ built Ripon the Ripon platform. So this the, the platform that Cambridge Analytica deployed that accessed the algorithms that were that were developed using the misappropriated Facebook data, the actual platform that all of that was put into, Ripon, was, was built by Aggregate IQ. Um, Aggregate IQ has an intellectual property license agreement with Cambridge Analytica, or rather with its parent company, SEO Group, which means that whenever it produces uh, you know, software or technology for the company, SCL and Cambridge Analytica owns it, it's not AIQ. They have a and, and contemporaneous to the referendum in, in 2016, the only clients that AIQ had uh, were Cambridge Analytica and SCL Group. So, so the idea that these companies were somehow separate uh, you know, in, in the referendum, to me, is farcical when you're doing daily conference calls with, you know, the, with Cambridge Analytica about, it, at very least, all the other projects that you're working for them on. And the idea that Brexit just never happened to come up, to me, is farcical. It's ridiculous. Um, and you know, when when I when I met with with AIQ after um, you know the BuzzFeed article came out about you know the, the bizarre spending and whatnot, and I you know I talked to them, they they actually they showed me AIQ showed me the scheme that they had set up for vote leave, and frankly, what I saw did not look lawful to me because they did not silo any of the programs between Be Leave and Vote Leave and the DUP and Veterans for Britain and all this entire sort of web of you know, leave-affiliated campaigns. In this country, we have laws to prevent overspending because you know, a, a core principle of British democracy is that you listen to the voice of the people, not how much money you can spend. And a key, a key way to enforce that is rules against coordination. If you coordinate with a campaign, you have to declare that as an expense. If you, because if you did not have to, you could just, when you hit your spending limit, you could just set up campaign B, and when you hit that spending limit, you could set up campaign C, and D, and E, etc. And that's actually what Vote Leave did. Uh, they, they set up B Leave, which I think you'll, you know, you'll, you'll touch on. Um, but they, they set up these, these, these various entities simply to uh, not even, they didn't even bother to funnel money through Believe. They sent money directly to AIQ and just invoiced, put the you know, different, uh, different bill to address to Believe on the, on the invoicing. But and could, could, could just on that, if they, the underlying data, if they had a, a unique sort of proprietary yeah. deal with Cambridge Analytica, how do we know that between, if they were working for maybe you, that all these campaigns weren't sharing some underlying kind of measure. Well, that's a really important question, and that's why, you know, the, the, the really frustrating thing is that AIQ is hiding behind jurisdictional barriers because they are in Canada, which means that they are out of reach of British authorities. So they don't have to answer any questions of investigators. They can't be compelled to produce evidence. They can literally just sit there uh, and, and do nothing, and it's fine because they, they it, it doesn't matter if what they did was potentially unlawful here, uh, if, if you're in Canada, you, you're outside of the jurisdiction of British authorities. Well, what's, you, you were there at the beginning of the uh, setting up of AIQ, and if I, yeah. that's right, you're from that part of, you're from Vancouver, yeah? Or you knew people Yeah, the, the reason why it's on Vancouver Island is because that's where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that, that's why. And some of these people just didn't want to move to the UK. They yeah, they just to... you know when we were setting up uh, the development team at SCL and then later Cambridge Analytica, you know I went to people that I knew, you know from prior projects who were talented at what they did, um, and some of those people, uh, you know, were in were in <coughs> British Columbia on the west coast of Canada. Um, they had new families, they had new houses, and they weren't necessarily mobile. It's a, sort of a big deal to move to, to all of a sudden, you know. To a, to a different country, so the, the compromise was that a Canadian company would be set up, um, and that company would then license all of the IP that it was, that it was developing to SCL Group, um, 
and and that that company would function as the you know Canadian office or Canadian site. It was called when, SCL when, Canada. It was uh, yeah. So yeah, in internal in internal year. staff documents, it is listed as SCL Canada. AIQ is listed as responsible for the software development team under SCL Canada. It, on on SCL's website, um, you know, it was listed as SCL Canada. Zach Massingham was listed as the head of SCL Canada. Um, and, and, you know, it de facto operated as an internal part of SCL and then later Cambridge Analytica. And what Gizmodo revealed today is actual tangible proof that they, what, if, what I've been saying is that they built the Ripon platform. They built the platform that used the algorithms from the, the misappropriated Facebook data. Um, and, 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 you know, th th this, this company, uh, you know, are, are tied at the hip with Cambridge Analytica. To say that they're separate, it, to me, is farcical. So you say they're not even a, it's not a sister company, it's a, almost a clone company, it's the same Like year. a franchise. Uh, before we go to Shamir and, and what the work he did with AIQ, can you just explain the difference between uh, what Cambridge Analytica did with the data and what AIQ did with targeted, because the AIQ were big on the targeted ads, that you could so create a bespoke ad for each person, or yeah, how does so, that work? So the, 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 the role of, of AIQ in developing the, RIP, the RIPON platform, the RIPON technology, was, was the deployment side of the algorithms. So it's all fine and dandy to have algorithms and predictions about people, but you actually have to have an effective means of, of, of actually delivering a, an advert to eyeballs, right? And so that's the role that AIQ played. They built a platform that was able to connect this algorithm with this advert you know, all the way to this tar this this particular target person. And that's that's automated a lot of it. Yeah, it's programmatic ad advertising. But so you'd have a term like lock her up, you know, predators, you know, whatever it was. You 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 yeah. match imagery and narratives to your target and then send that. And that's done automatically, like by yeah. by, by bots. Yeah. Well, not not by a bot, but yeah, it's done programmatically. Yeah. yeah. So you, <laughs> we're going back to 2000 and, is it, when did you first get involved? Late 2015, early 2016. 2000, early 2016. And you were a economics student mm -hmm. at the University of Zangli. <laughs> you were living your life in complete oblivion all this. Tell us <laughs> how you ended up in this world. Um, so I graduated, well, I graduated in May, but my graduation date was December, 20, December 2015. Uh, and I sort of, you know, I was a graduate, so I was looking for work, obviously. Wasn't getting any jobs, so I just said, oh, well, you know, I was interested in politics, so I got in touch with Chris, who I've known for like, what, four years, five years? Um, and I said, I knew that he had worked on the Liberal Democrat campaign, coalition government, so I said, can I get involved with, do you know anyone in the Leave campaign? Because, you know, I was your skeptic, but coming out of University of East Anglia, which is like full of hipsters, I was sort of like, you know, like I was like hiding it. Did you know Chris was a Euro skeptic as well? Um, I knew that he was involved in politics, but we hadn't really. So could you have been working for the Remain campaign had he known somebody there? No, because no, I didn't know any. The only person I knew in politics was Chris. Oh, okay. So like, <laughs> um, and then Chris would like one rants about like how uh, you know the EU is this, the EU is that, and the, but like reasonable, not like you know they're coming from Turkey. Um, no. Yeah, it wasn't like that. Um, so yeah, he got me in touch with, he messaged Stephen Parkinson, uh, who was then national organizer for Vote Leave, um, and said, yo, it's just send him a picture, didn't you, of me? Yeah. Like, is this? Uh, well, I, I prefaced the picture <laughs> with, with uh, hey, my friend is really interested in politics. And yeah. uh, interestingly, Stephen Parkinson uh, issued a statement uh, saying that what I've said in terms of introducing Shamir was untrue. Yeah. And then I produced the emails and the text messages yeah, showing that I actually them. did introduce it. Yeah, lapsed in memory, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I got in touch with Stephen, and then we I was invited into the Voldy headquarters in March. Uh, it's in March 2016, uh, and we sat down and started talking about how I could, you know, how I could contribute. And really, immediately the conversation became about how like someone being Pakistani Muslim could sort of contribute to uh, the Voldy cause, and because you know Voldy from the start had made it. Uh, imperative that they uh, set up different outreach groups to target specific um, communities, which is normal in a campaign. Um, and you sort of, obviously, you sort of pick niches. Obviously, black and ethnic minority communities, even though 
as diverse as they are, come under one banner. Uh, but uh, you know, I was like, I can, you know, I can, and we talked about how it was uh, important for people like me to get involved because they couldn't just win based on you know angry UKIPers. That they were a different campaign. They got the official designation, and part of the reason was was it that they were more liberal. They were kind of a, an open seas, more global idea. Of well, yeah. Brexit. So a, a, a significant part of one is getting as many people to vote leave or not vote remain as possible, and the other was in designation. It does work in your favor if you say we have all these different communities backing us. So like I worked with for vote leave. I worked at Muslims for Britain. Um, I work, you know, with a bunch of outreach groups helping. I tried helping set up Asians for Britain, but um, the, it like flopped. Um, but you know, I was heavily involved with the outreach team under Cleo Watson, you know, Gadget Baines, you know, even constantly communicating with Stephen. Um, so yeah, April time came, and I, that's actually as soon as I joined, I met. Um, well, I can. You met Darren. I mean, I met Darren, and I can say this now because I wasn't out before. But you know, I met like. Because I, I met Darren at the Out and Proud event, and I've said this in my witness statement, just not publicly, because I wasn't out and proud. Um, the witness statement to who? Well, to the Electoral Commission. Um, but I met Darren at the Out and Proud event, and we immediately clicked, immediately clicked. You know, his values were progressive. He wasn't voting leave because he, you know, he didn't like migrants. He, voted, he was voting leave because he believed in a sort of a brighter future for Britain, one that was that sort of reconnected with places across the globe, with growing economies. You know, even even he and Darren said, you know, countries like Pakistan, and India, and b before he even knew I was Pakistani. So you know, they immediately like I was like, okay, this guy's this guy's cool. And it's a working class background. His yeah, family. like he's a he's a very liberal, progressive guy. Yeah, a fashion um, student who and a fashion student. But yeah, was suddenly given six hundred twenty-five, six hundred. Yeah, so that happened afterwards. So I, I, but but you're, you before we get to that bit. Mm. Um, the ads which Darren and you were producing, then you, you joined, Believe was created as an official organization or merged out of Vote Leave, your outreach. No, Vote Leave, Vote Leave set up Believe. Right. You know, it was, it, all the passwords and emails were set up by Vote Leave. But Vote before Leave. then, Darren was doing ads then that were very successful. Right? Oh, he was, well, he wasn't doing ads, right. he was doing content. Right. Darren's work was excellent when it came to content. He was making very impactful graphics uh, and pushing them out, and some of which were, were performing. Um, Better than some of Bodhi's in, in terms of engagement rates, better than Bodhi's paid ads. So what was it? So he was doing the. He was doing the. It turns out people like uh, nice things more than they like uh, angry, angry, scary yeah. things about yeah. Turkey. And his ads were like sort of African farmers would benefit if there weren't these tariffs. Yeah, from and EU protectionism harms African farmers. Uh, you know, we need to curtail passport discrimination, which was a huge factor for me being not from Europe. Um, so it was sort of imperative to the reason why I was, you know, voting Leave. Um, Explain that. I just unpack that because your uh, EU passport is the whole of the EU. Once we became EU, your passport became much more difficult. Yeah, I never, I never, process. you know, a prior. I never agreed with this idea, and I know, you know, for, for me it was very much about. I didn't agree with the idea of anyone having advantages over someone else for where they are from. That core concept never sat well with me. For whatever reason, uh, you know, you people. I, and I totally understand why other people would want to vote remain, but for me, leaving was was and still is uh, a matter of equality, justice. That Britain had, one, had an obligation to uh, start uh, trade deals and relationship, stronger relationships with countries that it had left behind, um, as well as um, not base its migration policy on having, you know, the, the weird sort of way it works is, you know, you have your immigration from uh, non-EU places and you have your free movement from EU places, which fundamentally, as someone who isn't European, didn't sit well with me. Um, and Believe talked about that, and that's something that I immediately connected with. And so April time, Stephen Parkinson said, why don't you go work on Believe? But before we get there, just to explain the, how powerful Darren's content and your outreach work was, I think I've seen a, uh, one of Darren's, uh, not ads, content, arguments, mm. like post, it's like yeah. post. And it had naturally 40,000 shares, right? This is important because we'll get to some of the Important. Organically, organically, yeah. which then it's Facebook, yeah. forty thousand shares with Facebook costing at worth two thousand pounds if you had to pay for yeah. it. So naturally, it's getting forty. Which if you've ever tried, we did the festival advertise on on Facebook. That is popular. Mm -hmm. So you guys were roaring ahead. And by the way, at this point, did you know the main key members, the staff, Cummings, and you met Gove? Or I had an I had an idea. I mean, obviously, I knew the politicians. You know, it was quite. Uh, exciting for me to sort of you know be constantly bumping into like you know seeing like Michael Gold walking in Boris Johnson. Exciting. Yeah, 
Because, you know, these are, like, look, you have to keep <laughs> Look, I get it now. Now, obviously, I have a different sort of opinion regarding that. But, like, um, it was, you know, you're, you're, it was my first political campaign. And you were a volunteer. You weren't and a paid, volunteer. And paid nothing, and even your train fares weren't paid. Yeah, there, there was one. When I started, a few train fares were paid for. But, like, you know, it was my own money that I was spending on food. Get it, most of the time getting to London. And accommodation, how did you and Darren? Well, sometimes I would crash at friends, and so we'd work around it. So you're complete volunteers. At that point, you were 23 and Darren 22. was... 22. 22. Yeah. Well, I turned 22 in February, but... And Darren yeah. was at the same age. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so this, this, this sort of outreach you were doing with Darren was really su successful. Tell us about the setting, if you want to watch. Tell us about the setting up of, of Believe. As an organization? Yeah, yeah, and why, and, and how you were approached at just, you know, that point. Because this is like 10 days yeah. before yeah. the referendum voted. So. If you guys like wanted a sort of more, uh, less jumbled up version, as, as, as you should be the Guardian article that Carl said while the road, because it does go through all of this. Um, if, well, I'm sure you all have. Um, uh, but, you know, um, where do I, where was I? But so, the, what moment, you know, when, when suddenly you're told you're a separate organization mm -hmm. you're, and you're going to get... Um, well, that was a process. Pounds. That, was a, that was a process, right? We started off with a donor coming in who contacted about Leave and said, look, I'm interested in Believe. I want to uh, give money to Believe um, or consider giving money to Believe. And then so Clear Watson arranged a meeting with Darren Grimes, me, uh, and two other Believe volunteers with this donor in the Vote Leave meeting room. Uh, keep in mind that I'm constantly, well, the only place I work is Vote Leave. Like, I don't, like, sort of yeah. have any, Vote Leave doesn't have any offices. We're based in Vote Leave headquarters as an outreach group. So we talk to the donor, we get, you know, we start speaking and sort of, we, we sort of talk about, like, maybe it'd be good to have a proposal. Donor goes, Darren and I bring up a proposal, send it to voting staff because we start thinking, okay, if people are interested in Vote Leave, because we are doing great work, let's, you know, see what they say. And so we send out a proposal. Um, and then we were advised by Cleo Watson, who's head of outreach for Vote Leave, um, speak to William Norton, who was the lawyer. Uh, and, he, and he suggested if you want to have, uh, start uh, getting money, you have to set up as a separate campaign. As I said, because the voting limits were, yeah. the spending limits were getting reached. So the yeah, so, you know, the, I knew that other, other Vote Leave outreach groups were like given money for their specific causes. Um, so I still don't know why we, we, well I know now why we were specifically asked to set up as a separate campaign. But uh, uh, at that time it was just like the way for you to get money is to set up as a separate campaign. And so how much money did you, you, you put this pitch out yeah. and you expected what, to get 10,000? So the baseline was 10,000 pounds. If you could get 10,000 pounds it'd be, we'd be like so great, like it'd be perfect. And then there was like a brief note where it was like if, if we had 100,000 pounds, which we just put in for the sake of it. I even, I even remember having the conversation with Darren, let's just, put, let's just put that in for the sake of it, you never know. You know, some of these people are rich, like they'll give some money. Um, and then, yeah, so. Uh, and what happened, how, how long, between the pitch and hearing that you got her some money was yeah. there, how, how long did you have to wait for that? Well, once we, well, once we sent our the proposal, et cetera, obviously that donor pulled out. Well, apparently the donor pulled out. Um, but we had already started talking to William Norton. He was advising us through the process of setting up the separate organization. Um, he, you know, he wrote the constitution document, uh, set it up as an unincorporated association. Um, You're the secretary in... I, and I became the secretary and treasurer, whereas Darren was chairman. So Darren, Darren and campaign manager. So Darren, the way that... The, the document that William Norton has set up made Darren legally liable, uh, as, as in the person responsible uh, for... As a 22-year-old. As a 22-year-old. Um, he's the, Just to reiterate, this is William Norton was Vote Leave's lawyer. Yeah, right? head of so, compliance. So the idea that you have a separate campaign, uh, you know, a totally separate campaign, but the Vote Leave lawyers were writing the Constitution and advising you know the, the 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 volunteers on how to set it up. It doesn't sound very separate. It we doesn't were, sound we were, very separate. We were volunteers <laughs> doing what we were asked to do. Yeah. Dan and I don't have any experience running an organization as much as we like to think we were super like <laughs> smart, but we don't. You know, we didn't. So we went through it with the expectation that everything that we were doing was was perfectly fine. That it was good. You advised that this we weren't lawyers. You know, we were being advised by a lawyer, so we did what the lawyer asked. We set up a bank account, everything was hunky-dory, and we were a separate organization, and everything remained the same. I was still coming to the Vote Leave office. 
Um, you're still claiming you're not getting your train fares paid? Yet? Well, yeah, no. And so what was the <laughs> donation came in eventually? Um, so about a, a week after that, um, and this was two weeks, somewhat two weeks before the referendum day, where Victoria Woodcock, who's the chief operating officer of Woody, said, hey, we, I think we found you a way of getting you money. And we were like, cool, okay, good, but finally. Um, let's sort that out quick. Uh, and then later, Darren tells me we're getting almost 700,000 pounds. And, you know, people are like, oh, didn't you question it? And I was like, no. I was a, you know, I was, I was, I was a 22-year-old volunteer who was finding difficult to find a job already. And so having it, like, having the opportunity to put on my LinkedIn secured 700,000 pounds. <laughs> What person wouldn't do that? I was, I was elated. I was like, that's amazing. That's awesome. So the first thing I asked him was, okay, so can I get some money for train expenses? <laughs> uh, food, you know? Yeah. The basic things that you ask for, because seeing as I'm treasurer and secretary of the outreach. Um, uh, and he says, no, I don't think I can. And there was confusion. And he was like, I don't think I can. It has to go straight to AIQ. So this, you don't know the donor. You don't know no. the uh, we assume it's not a foreign person. Uh, it, that seemed to do two different figures, 625, six, uh, 675, but there's a... The, the official number is now 625,000. Yeah, okay. Uh, but it never came to your bank account, did it? No, it didn't touch our bank account. It was paid straight to AIQ, through Holy, as a donation in kind, which is, um, which, it, which you, you, and let me be clear, you can do that, but it's just you can't coordinate. You can't just... Otherwise, you're just sort of, if you know exactly what Believe's strategy is and what Believe is doing, and you're sort of working with Believe, coordinating, and when we're using office facilities, when we're speaking to Voli staff about what we're doing, when we are, in effect, coordinating every aspect of it and being instructed on how to go about the process. It doesn't sound like coordination. It sounds like subordination. Oh. Like, you had no choice where that money went. It went to, do you know where the money was spent on ARQ? What, well, what your ads, or what was it spent see, on? AIQ, we did obviously work, we started working with AIQ during the last days of the referendum. We were spending hundreds of thousands of pounds as two 20 year olds on our project. But I never saw the results of 625,000 pounds. You know, we had what, gathered how many emails? 1,000, uh, just, 160, yeah, like just one, just, <laughs> just above 1,000 emails. I mean, for 625,000 pounds, that amounts to about what? 600, you're a smart guy. <laughs> it's like 600. Pounds an email. Yeah. It would be cheaper Which is to, to well, go I, out into Oxford Circus with 50 pound notes and throw it at people hoping that they would give yeah. you your email address. I, I, I did a bit of math. I did a bit of math based on that one, uh, one of Dan Grimes's content, which had uh, 40,000 interactions, not impressions, interactions. That's likes, comments, and shares. Uh, much more engaging than impression. Uh, I did a quick bit of math. I didn't do it. I did it on my phone. Uh, but basically, 625 would buy you 13.5 million interactions on Facebook. That's not impressions. Impressions are more important. Yeah. Interactions at that rate. But you don't know where that money went. So the fast forward, you had, you probably celebrated the night of the referendum. I was excited. I was, you know, the day we won, it was amazing. You know, I had, it's my first political campaign. Uh, I had secured, on, you know, I used, I put in my LinkedIn first almost a million pounds. Yeah. It's like, you know, I secured almost 700,000, I secured, well, 625,000 pounds, but on my LinkedIn, it was almost 700,000 pounds. Yeah, yeah, you know, like, um, but I was, ex I was excited because now I had some experience and, and proof of the, of the hard work that I had, I had put in, um, and, I, and we had won the campaign, you know? I wrote, I remember writing, won the referendum campaign. And, and, and then what happened? Did you get a job in politics, or, or did you uh, no? I started job? started working at Topman as a oh. sales assistant for a bit. Went back. I was in Birmingham. Uh, I was looking for work. Obviously, could have been looking for work, but I started working as a sales assistant at Topman. Uh, but August time, the Busted article came up. So August two thousand and sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah. This after this, the referendum. If they go, what was this weird spend? Yeah. Suddenly, to a fashion student. Of yeah. like what happened when the bus figure? Well, Darren was devastated. Darren was panicking. Darren was like, I, you know, I don't want to go to jail, etc. And like seeing things like, I was like, chill out, like it's cool. So the first people we went, the first people that contacted us and that we communicated with were about these staff members. So Paul Stevenson and Antonia Flockton, 
And these are all senior members of uh, Leave and Victoria Woodcock, um, and even Stephen Parkinson, were advising us how to respond to it. The electoral commission response. The, uh, we were, you know, we were told don't speak to the media. This is. Uh, we were told don't speak to the media. Um, it's best to, you know, just they're just they're just remoning. They're just remoners. But but were you allowed to tell the truth to the electoral commission? Were you told to just not? Just well, when shut up? when the BuzzFeed article happened, you know, there wasn't anything going on like, going on. We sort of Darren was communicating with still with all the senior members of ODU, You know, as as was I. You know. So and Darren was working for them, was he at this point? Because he'd set up Brexit Central. I'm not sure. I think he started. I think he started. Yeah, if he started working at Brexit Central at that time, I'm not sure. Exactly. But you then get your. You no longer stay a top man. You start working for Matthew Elliott. Yeah, example. the Taxpayers Alliance. Would you, retrospectively, do you think you're being brought under a wing there? You know what? Like I, just for the sake of you know, I. I've, I've thought of this question, I've thought of this, I have, um, but it's like, it's not really good for me if I sort of come out of this and try to find a job and say every place that's hired me, just hired me to use me. No, you are clearly much more but, smart than that, and but, you're still working, just to check, you're still working. Oh yeah, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still employed by it. Have you been into work since? Uh, uh, no, actually, um, I won't fault them, they've, they've, like, my boss, my boss, who's not Matthew, yeah, my yeah, CEO, yeah. John O'Connell, um, has been very good, but he's just been like, take your, take your time, do what you need to do. And they treat you quite well. And then, so Chris must have, am I right, Chris? You approached when you started looking at what the, you know, your, the company, you were the mind but not the soul, had done. Did you realise what Shimmy had been? At what point did you approach him and say, "What happened at Buzzfeed?" Um, well, after the Buzzfeed article came out, I mean, Darren sent me, you know, a flurry of messages. Like, you know, clearly he was very upset by the whole thing. Uh, and you know he he blamed me for putting him in the situation. You know he 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 trusted everybody at Boat Leave, and I you know said no, oh, you can trust these people. And 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 you know I assumed that when I would introduce <clears throat> two twenty-two year old volunteers on a campaign, you know I introduced them in good faith that this would be a really good opportunity to. You know, get some political experience. It's really hard to get your foot in the door in politics, um, and so whenever I encounter people who are interested, I'll you know go to my way, irrespective of whatever party, you know, to introduce them to people that I know. Um, and he was very upset. He was upset with me for, you know, not necessarily warning him that this could happen. Although I, did, you know, genuinely didn't think that, you know the people that I introduced him to would actually go to the length of using two 22-year-old interns on, you know, a, a project that, you know, potentially was unlawful, uh, and then also have the lawyer set it up in a way that would make Darren personally liable for all of that spending. Um, so I was quite concerned by it, um, and, you know, and then when, you know, and then the Telegraph article came out about, you know, AIQ sort of bragging about you know how effective they were and all of that and so, so you felt responsible at that moment where your your Canadian friends have set up some of your British friends yeah yeah and it's not a good feeling um, to so I must say can I just comment briefly Chris is amazing not just as a whisper himself is helpful not just Shamir but other uh, whistleblowers forward and so you feel I wouldn't have done this I wouldn't have been able to do it without Chris's help um, just in terms of the, as a friend it's so this kind of I mean, it's a it's a big it's a big deal for people to come forward. Um, but uh, to get back to your yeah. to your question, and so you know, I I asked Darren what happened. I then asked Shamir what happened. Um, and you know, I've worked in British politics, uh, you know, for years, so I'm familiar, you know, roughly with Papira and and you know, anti coordination rules. And and a lot of countries that I've worked in, you know, there's similar equivalent rules. You know, you can't coordinate different campaigns. Uh, and so immediately, you know, my ears perked when, when, you know, they started telling me about, you know, the management structure of Believe and how it was reporting to Vote Leave. And in my head, I'm going, this doesn't really sound like it's a separate campaign. This sounds like it's an internal body of Vote Leave. Um, and so that's when I then went, you know, and I was in Canada at the time, so I had the benefit of being in Canada and went and talked to AIQ about it. And I actually asked them, I said, show me the program that you were actually doing. Um, and, and they did, and 
you know, what they showed me was not siloed. Uh, they treated all of this as just a giant pot of money to optimize adverts. Um, and, you know, they conceded that it was, you know, probably illegal in the UK. So that actually 625, that just went whoosh into this big... And you have to remember, box. you have to remember, AIQ didn't just work on the BB project, they also worked for the DUP, and they also continued working for the DUP in, in, the, in the last election, and for Veterans for Britain, for, with £100,000 from Veterans for Britain also, uh, in addition to 40% of voters. So a lot of money went to AIQ. Um, you know, and and when when they showed me what they were doing, I you know I got quite upset by it because you know I felt like I didn't do my job as as uh, you know in, on one hand as a friend and in, in another as a as a mentor to to Darren and to to Shamir who were trying to get involved in politics to really check to make sure that you know what what vote League was doing with them was actually compliant. It wasn't going to get them in trouble. Um, so you feel responsible in a way, that's why. Absolutely, because a company that I helped set up, uh, you know, was responsible for the actual targeting and, 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 and all of this money got pulled into this company that I helped set up. And the people who are on the hook for it are two interns who I introduced to a campaign in good faith that that, that would be a positive experience for them. So, you know, when I moved, and then I moved back to the UK, and I started talking to, um, you know, various people that I knew who were involved in this in, in this uh, this scheme, um, you know, and I said, look, I, uh, this doesn't strike me as something that was lawful. Uh, you know, have you thought about coming forward with it? And a lot of people didn't want to because it's a it's a really big deal to come forward. As, you know, as as. I was I was there with Shamir when he got outed by Downing Street, and it was, uh, you know, I mean I can't imagine how you felt, but my heart was breaking when I saw that. Um, it's all right. And um, <laughs> um, and and you know so so the, the the thing that I had to sort of think about is okay well you know we need to make sure that if 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 somebody you know. Darren or Shamir is coming forward that we can make sure that you know we can find them pro bono legal advice that we can you know work with with media and and um, this explain what that is yeah, that's one of the binders of evidence there's three of those um, so we worked with um, uh, lawyers um, to to collate all of the evidence so I you know when Shamir you know, the, the thing that really took me off too is that after talking to you, you know, you showed me uh, this drive that they had uh, where they put all of this material on. So they, so Vote Leave uh, set up a shared drive where uh, all of the advertising content that was being produced, and actually not just Beely content, there was also Vote Leave content on that drive, uh, was put on. Um, strategy documents, you know, performance reports, you know, legal documents, um, all of that was put onto a central drive that was managed and administered by Vote Leave, by Victoria Woodcock, who is the Chief Operations Officer of Vote Leave, managing this BB drive. Um, and when you looked at, you know, who was on it, you had, you know, a ton, of, a ton of people from Vote Leave, a ton of people from Be Leave, and a ton of people from AIQ. And I looked at this and I go, this looks suspicious. Uh, and then, and then Shamir pointed out, oh, you should look at this activity log. So I, oh, is that I, how you reconstructed this, I, this amazing I looked, gift? I, I, of the, I yeah. Of so, deleting information. so, we, so we then looked at the activity log, and what it showed was Victoria Woodcock. You know, um, a week and a half after, in terms of the date, it was a week and a half after they were notified that they were being put under investigation by the Electoral Commission and, and the Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, very shortly after, Victoria Woodcock uh, went onto the drive because she's the administrator and still is the administrator of this drive, but, but by this, uh, of, of this drive, and went and removed, specifically removed uh, Dominic Cummings, who is the campaign manager, um, and Henry DeZoot, who is the head of digital, from a, a better part of 100 documents, right? And so when you so then when you look at the drive, uh, you know, on the face of it, it doesn't look like, you know, Dominic Cummings is on this drive. But then when you look at the history of the act in, in the activity log, you can see, well, it's because Victoria Woodcock removed access, you know, 
a week and a half after being notified that they were all under investigation. So, so and to me, that, that looks suspicious. I don't understand why you would do that. Right? I, first of all, I don't understand if you have separate campaigns, okay, why is it that the vote leave lawyers set up the Constitution, first of all, okay? If it's a separate campaign, why did your lawyers set it up? Secondly, if it's a separate campaign, why did you have a shared drive, okay? Why did you share advertising? Why did you share performance reports? Why did you share legal documents? Thirdly, after you were notified that, you, th that the ICO and the Electoral Commission were investigating the matter, why did you go on and remove Dominic Cummings, Victoria Woodcock, and Henry Jazoot from that drive? These are questions that Vote Leave needs to answer. And, and, and the unfortunate thing is that the, the press has made this out to be you know, some sort of bizarre lover's quarrel between Shamir and, and, and Stephen Parkinson, rather than looking at the weight of evidence about the potential unlawful coordination and overspending of Vote Leave. Um, and, so to focus this, on that. This is, this is what people should be focusing on. This is what the media should be focusing on. So, so, so to focus on whatever happened to the evidence when investigations are underway, the potential wider allegations involving the EDU as well as both the is you have coordination, overspending, and potentially foreign debt. These are an array of things that should be looked at. Specifically, and, 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 and in addition, like, where was the data? Where's the data? Like, the, 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 the official statement that was given to the ICO um, is insane. That the idea that, that <laughs> Believe spent 625,000 pounds, and the only data that was collected after spending 625,000 pounds was 1,000 a, a email addresses. So, and that's, that's their official line. That's what they sent to the information commissioner's office. And I told the ICO, I said, you know, have you, ever, have you actually just worked out the, the, you know, the, the, the per capita cost, the per email cost of that? It's insane. It, literally, it would have been cheaper and more effective for them to take 50 pound notes in Oxford Circus and just throw it at people. And you would have got more email addresses. You would have got, it's insane. Yeah. And, the, and so I, I'm, you know, when I started looking at all of this evidence, I'm just going, this, you know, I, I I'm, I'm, a, I'm a year skeptic. I, I don't, this is not me trying to rehash some kind of remain leave argument, but more fundamentally, it doesn't matter if you were leave or remain. If you believe in democracy, you need to also believe in the rule of law and that cheating, you know, it, you, you cannot allow cheating, regardless of whatever, whatever side you're on. This is, this is such an important <laughs> vote. Uh, and an important vote. moment for this country. It is an irreversible change to the constitutional settlement of this country. And, and, and the idea that there was potentially pervasive cheating uh, on the vote leave side, on the side that I support it, um, you know, it deeply concerns me because I, I, I supported leave because I believe in, 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 in British sovereignty and British democracy. But what I don't believe in is breaking British law. It's I mean, I, you know, and so we, this absolutely needs to be investigated. And the unfortunate thing is that our regulators, the ICO and the Electoral Commission, as much as they try, do not have that many powers to investigate, do not have a large team, do not have access to funding. You know, and, and, and the only thing that I see uh, that, that would be effective in, in, in this case is some kind of inquiry at Parliament. Because this is okay. too important to screw up. You know, if, if we screw up the referendum, we're potentially irreversibly screwing up the constitutional settlement of this country. And every election, we need course. to be sure that this is genuinely the democratic will of the people and that this is not a result that was bought with money. Before we go to questions, I'd like you to think about quite, quite nice short questions, not statements, uh, please. Uh, Shamir, just, just asking you, because you were in that boat leave office, um, did you mix with senior figures like, did you ever meet Bobo or, or Boris Johnson, or did you have a sense that they knew what was happening with Believe, or any way that they knew what was happening with the spend? Everyone was aware that Believe was an artificial football. There was no one that didn't know that. 
Did they know, do you think they knew you got this boost of money because you're so, did people congratulate you for the success? People congratulated Believe for what we had, what we had done. People did congratulate Darren Graham for Believe. There was no, every, everyone in the office <coughs> congratulated Darren for what he had done at Believe. So you weren't just like coffee, like George Papadopoulos, you know? No. Whatever, you know, to, you know, Trump says he's just a coffee buy. You were essential back again. <coughs> Okay, let me open up questions. I'm going to take three at a time. Thank you so much. That's the first, I said I was Stanley Johnson. The second, I said I didn't want to talk about the dead cat theory. Thirdly, I said, <laughs> thirdly, I said, because amongst other things, I've, I've written a novel called Compromat, which suggests the Russians were involved. We're talking about that about 10 days from now here. I really want to know what you, you think about whether, for example, some of the funding might have come from non UK sources, even Soviet sources. And do you think? some of the as well, information, the trolling, etc., could also have come from, from Russia, because that would put this whole argument with your advancing, it seems to be, in a, in a, in a new, in a new in one stage further. Do you that's, see what I mean? So that's, that's brilliant. I, and I'll pass that question Michael, on. Michael, I'm wondering if you can please um, tell us, was there any coordination with DUP and Veterans for Britain? We've seen how two streams of money funneled into AIQ. Uh, were they also on your computer email list? Uh, were they... Were they interacting with you in the office, was there any overlap whatsoever? Okay. And Chris, just if I could just ask a quick follow-up. That's two questions. Question. Um, you've been painted by Cambridge Analytica as a part-timer, a fellow who didn't even work there a year. Why, why, why? You really, in, in their opinion, you really wouldn't know anything about Brexit. I'm wondering what was your actual role there and what interaction did you have with Dr. Spector slash Kogan? Okay, thank you, please kill that. Um, the thousand emails for six hundred and twenty-five thousand pounds was that simply money very badly spent, or was it used for something else? And if so, what? Now, secondly, Chris said very early on. Ah, ah that's a two question, very, very, people. Very, very early on. Thank you, Peter. You're very kind. Uh, you said very early on, uh, not in relation to the, the to the referendum, but more broadly, that you could use this target to send the you know, bad kind of misinformation and so on. What did that happen? in the referendum campaign. Can you give any specific examples? As well, leaving aside the money, and that side of the legality, was it misused in terms of uh, fake news being put out through this device? Okay, thank you, Peter. So the three questions, or well, the four questions are, uh, and I think I, a lot of these are actually directed to Chris, though. I think, Shamir, you can ask, uh, ask, answer the second one. The first one from Stanley is, well, either of you answer this. Foreign spending, was there a sense, basically, were the Russians involved, were the big oligarchs involved? Does anybody have an answer to that now of their own experience? Um, what I do know, uh, and, and, and what I've talked about um, previously, is the, the fact that um, several researchers at Cambridge Analytica also had projects uh, in Russia funded by the Russians on profiling, on psychological profiling. Um, and that the, the company was regularly interfacing with Russian companies that have very no, very open links with the FSB, which is the Russian Intelligence Service. This is the, you know, and, and in addition, you know, Cambridge Analytica pitched uh, Kogan's Russian work, or quote, Kogan's work for the Russians, to various clients in different countries. So um, I, I'm not, I, I, I can't say, one way or the other, you know, were the Russians involved in Brexit? But what I can say is, you had a company that was involved in Brexit for Levy U, uh, that 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 d does have, uh, you know, questions to answer about, you know, whether or not risks were created when it was, you know, having its researchers go back and forth between here and Russia and and interfacing with Russian companies talking about what it does that have known links to the FSB. Um, I can't say. You know the, the specific point to your question uh, about, about about you know foreign foreign interference, um, but I think that there's there's a valid point to be made, which is that given you know what is emerging and and what we're learning about Cambridge Analytica, that is something that Parliament you know and investigators should be asking. And it's on the same your second question. I think the second of your two questions about COVID and uh, his involvement with Russia. He's the guy who becomes Dr. Spectre for a while. He has explained why he changed his name. To well, he, he changed it because it means a ray of light. Ah. It's, a, it's to Nothing shine to James light. Bond and uh, being <laughs> <laughs> no. 
but and, and he was the the researcher who went went to Peter, to Petersburg. Yeah, with so a lot of the data. He, he had um, ongoing projects in Russia, um, based out of Saint Petersburg, to do psychological profiling work, um, and this was at the same time as he was working on data harvesting projects for Cambridge Analytica. Um, so, in terms of is that sort of the question? Yeah, I think, do, I, remind yeah. me what, what it what, is that you'd like to mention. Relationship. relationship with COVID. Because they painted as somebody who was a part timer who didn't really know the Oh, right. Time. Okay, right. Okay, right. Let me just, like, this is. Can we just hold is, that one? Actually, you okay. think about that one because I want the two weather in my head because there are now five questions coming at once. <laughs> um, ask Shamir the two simple ones. One is about did you have any evidence of collusion or working together with the DUP? And veterans for Britain as belief? Yeah, no, no, no. no. You didn't. But see veterans that. for Britain was an artificial for what leave? It was not. Yeah, but you didn't see that money coming into. And the second question is, Peter Kellner put. Uh, did you? Well, I, I think I can comment on that because oh, because again, sure. I was in the AIQ office. They're showing me the, the oh, photographs. So, so. And and just to be super clear, you know, what they showed me was not siloed. So they took money from various different sources and treated it as the same ad spend. So that, you know, we have the most, we have, you know, the benefit of, you know, several whistleblowers, uh, Shamir being the, the, you know, the named face of that, but several also uh, confidential sources um, for belief. So we have the most amount of evidence there. But, you know, having seen what uh, AIQ was working on when they showed me, that also included the DUP uh, money. And they, they continued to work for the DUP, you know, well, in the past election, even, um, and, and Veterans for Britain. Just a shout out here, Peter Guggen from The Ferret is here, and they've, and they've done amazing work, Open Democracy, uh, looking at the DUP spend, where it came from, and why, because of Northern Irish, uh, what was in Northern Ireland, to protect from uh, you know, this history of terrorism, that donors are not named. And so that's a kind of game. There's a second question, sorry, that was asked from Peter Kellner of you, uh, Shamir. Did you sense that beyond the content, did you see any content was like fake news, like, you know, weird thing, I bring a pencil, or something that would deter, or from fake information, bring voters to leave or remain. Did you see any of that in the work that Belief did? Was it, you know, was it fake, was it always obviously campaign advertising, or was it linking to a Breitbart site saying? Um, no, I can't, I can't comment on that. I okay, just to, really it's just as I asked the question. Okay. So I, I, I think, to, just to make clear, that the, part of the, the purpose of Belief wasn't what, what, what was actually to to have a, you know an anti narrative to the well, the overarching VL well, narrative, the positive one. You know because vote leave understood that you know, it was imperative to have not just like angry Ukipers. Like they needed to have people that were progressive. They needed to have people that were liberal. They needed to have you know green people that were only in the, working for the Green Party. They needed to have people that were working for Labour, Muslims. Uh, uh, you know, Sikh men and women, uh, Hindu men and women, you know, African, uh, Afro Caribbean, they are from the Afro Caribbean. So they're unlikely to link to refugees or one of these weird well, stories about you know, the, immigrants. It, 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 that's, that was the main belief stuff, right? But when you sort of, uh, you have to think about that they needed to ensure that they got as many people voting leave and as many people as possible as not wanting to vote remain. And, and okay. it, to put it more simply, you, they had to win less badly or they had to lose less badly with progressives. And so yeah. the purpose of Believe was to present a much more progressive outlook on, on what Brexit could look like. Um, so so it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't intended the to, to, to yeah. link to Breitbart or any of that. It, it was quite the opposite. Yeah. Um, but I, I haven't, I still haven't actually answered your question. Can so we, me, well, okay. Um, all right, do you want to just very quickly answer that? Because I mean, you, are you just a copy boy? Yeah. <laughs> so um, the answer is they're using weasel words. Okay, so I was the director of research. If you want like evidence of that, I can show you my old business cards. I can show you you know reams of, of emails and, and evidence of that, which the New York Times has seen, which the Guardian has seen, which Channel Four has seen. Um, Cambridge Analytica didn't exist when I started at. SCL group. Okay, I was the research director at, at, at SCL, and it was it was the work that I was doing uh, that then eventually led to the creation of Cambridge Analytica. the The idea that I left in July is not true. That's when I gave my notice. So what they're citing is when I told them that I wanted to leave, but the agreement was that I would then phase out my you know my, my time so that I didn't just 
you know, drop everything. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 point, the, the point that I'd make is, um, how on earth would I have, you know, the foundational incorporation documents to the company? You know, why is it that I have, you know, extensive email chains, you know, with, you know, Mercer's lawyers in setting up the actual company itself if I was just some part-time intern or whatever it is that they're saying, right? I was negotiating with Robert Mercer's lawyers, okay, setting up the company, right? I was the research director at SCL Group before Cambridge Analytica even existed. Okay. Right. So, so, so for them to say that is just using weasel words because Cambridge Analytica didn't exist when I started because Cambridge Analytica was based on the ideas and the research that I was doing at SEL. Hi, Isabel Hilton. Um, part of the fog of this argument is whether is what impact it has, and and so the other side is now saying, yeah, okay, but it made no difference. So I would like to know how you did quantify the impact, if you if you. Sure. Did. So the, the, can so I just, just, do you want to answer it? Immediately? Yeah, it's a lot easier if we just. Did. So, so yeah, yeah. the thing that I would say, first of all, we don't make this argument uh, when we find doping in the Olympics when you're caught cheating on an exam, because you know we don't we don't have the argument. Oh, he would you know this this gold medalist was caught doping and using performance enhancing drugs, but did it really make a difference? Did it not make a difference? They only used this drug, not that drug. They only had this amount of drug, so they probably would have won it anyway, so they should keep the medal, they shouldn't keep the medal. If you're caught cheating, you lose your medal. Okay? <laughs> this is a really important point, because it gets to a really fundamental, this is a really fundamental point about, you know, the integrity of our democratic process. If we allow people to cheat, okay, where does it end? There's no point in having rules if we just concede, concede in cheating. I'm with you there. That's yeah. Not my yeah. But I, but I well, the metrics. The what, the what, okay. what are the metrics to test success with return on investment? Yeah. But, so, 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 AIQ. So, so, when I was at Cambridge Analytica and we were working with AIQ, um, you know, they, they uh, one of the things that I gave to the, the the Guardian, although it hasn't been published, is conversion metrics that they have. Um, and they have insanely high conversion metrics. So a conversion is where somebody not only clicks on the material that you're presenting to them, but then follows through on a particular action, right? And so when, you know, typical online ads, right, you'll have a conversion rate of a percent maybe, and that's, that's often good. You'll have less than a percent. I've seen programs that AIQ have run that were seven, 10% conversions. Okay, that's the power of data. That's the power of targeting. Um, Dom Cummings himself said that he could not have won without AIQ, right? It, 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 I think it, it speaks volumes to the fact that Vote Leave decided to spend 40% of its budget on this, on this company, right? But Why would they spend that amount of money if it wasn't effective? That's a brilliant answer. Uh, lady over there, go to the mic, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a slightly more techie question, but I read techie. somewhere that um, the misappropriated, misappropriated Facebook data was mainly US accounts and not UK accounts. Is that true? And if so, how did this then work in the UK? In the UK. That's a very good question. Well, can the mic be passed over to Peter Keegan at the back? And Well, um, so this is a quick quiz, because you're the expert on all this, uh, on technically. Why, how is it useful for Brexit to have ranges from 50 million American voters, Facebook data, 3,000, 5,000 points of data on each voter. How does it help? How could that help you with Brexit? Well, so let me start by saying um, that I actually had a meeting with Dominic Cummings before uh, when they were just setting up uh, Vote Leave. So this would have been in November 2015. Published some of that on email. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's sort yeah. of, he's attacking me for it when I'm completely open about it. I met with Dominic Cummings, um, and he was really interested in, uh, you know, the work that Cambridge Analytica was doing, um, and Stephen Parkinson knew that I helped set up the company, so he introduced us, and, and we chatted, and I, I, you know, started asking him, okay, so what kind of data do you have, right? In November 2015, they didn't even have the electoral register, so they didn't have any data. So he said, you know, how can how can we create what he what he called the palantir of politics? Palantir, explain palantir. Pa which palantir, is palantir being the uh, private contractors to the to the NSA. 
Um, and so one of the things that I said to him is I was slightly skeptical that he could recreate a Cambridge Analytica with the budgets and more importantly with the timeline that he had because he was starting with no data. And if, you know, you, you, it wasn't like his deadline was June. His deadline would have been February in order to have a functioning campaign to, to use that data. Um, it's a really good question, you know, where did the data come from? And how did AIQ get the data? One of the things that um, you know Carol at the Guardian has reported on, you know, almost a year ago, was the Trinidad project. And and on the Trinidad project, one of the things that AIQ was contracted to do is acquire data, including acquiring ISP data, um, you know, by any means necessary. ISP data meaning the sort of back end of what's happening on the internet. Yeah, and so and so when you look at some, you know. Frankly, you have a really good question, and it would be, the, the problem that we have here is that we can't actually get an answer because AIQ is based in Canada and they're not answering the questions of investigators. Brilliant. It, we're running out of time, so I have a question in the back from Peter. It, can I just uh, should we should we start asking questions of Shamir because he's I'm I, going I, to I, divert I, some to him. Yeah. Hopefully, some. Have you got a question for Shamir, or is this for? Chris? I think it's probably maybe for both of you. It's going continuing on the theme of AIQ. Because um, we found out today from Gizmodo that, yeah. um, which is really interesting story, that CA, Cambridge Analytica created AIQ's um, election software. And I have two very quick related questions. The first one is, you know, you're talking about you went to see AIQ and there were silos. I want you to just expand on that a little bit about what that meant. And when you're talking about all the uh, believe veterans for Britain, DUP, vote leave, that was all in together. Could you just talk a little bit more about what that looked like? But secondly, the one thing I've always wanted to know about this story was, who introduced vote leave in the first place to, uh, to AIQ? Where, where did that happen? Where did that come from? Okay, so, uh, again, everybody's getting the two <laughs> questions in. Do you want to answer that now, or anybody have you got to answer that? You, um, you don't, Shamil, unfortunately, it's not something you can Sure, so, you know, in terms of using ad, various ad platforms and and seeing that the that you had different adverts from different campaigns in the same ad program, that's not siloing, right? It's as simple as that. Um, in terms of um, who introduced who, you'll have to I, like it doesn't make the, the, it, it doesn't make sense what Dom Cummings said. I found them on the internet when they didn't even have a website, right? Because they were you know effectively an internal part of SCL and Cambridge Analytica. So that's a really good question. You should ask Dom that. Okay, so we have two more questions. This gentleman over there, those two hands together, and then one final one from the front row. Guys. Paul Connie from the New European, so you can guess where I'm coming from on Brexit. It's interesting to have two whistleblowers from uh, from a pro-Brexit side. But what worries me is how much we really think the Brexit result was influenced. I did research before, and although a strong Remainer forecast Brexit would actually win, based upon research in Labour's heartland seats in the Midlands and the North, looking at older generation voters who aren't particularly going to be on Facebook, etc. So, so how convinced are you okay. not that it actually did so influence the result of a Brexit? Sorry, people can't hear you. So you can have the second question at the same time, because we are going to wind up. So just for Shamir, why did you decide to come out about this now? Um, about, yeah, why did you decide to blow the whistle and believe, given your kind of career prospects? I'll uh, hold that because I think that's the great one to end on. We just have one third question. Sorry, I also, if, if I may, just a really <laughs> no. technical, boring question for Chris, which is that do you, were you ever aware of a commercial relationship between Facebook and Alexander Kogan? Uh, well, that's been, I think, been accounted for. So I have one more question here from the front. When, when this question is, yeah, I'm going to hold back to this question. I want to end on that. Uh, do you, while this is coming out, Chris, do you want to answer that question? They believe would have won anyway. I mean, you know, this is, seems so poor. It seems back to that same question. How do we know it made a difference? Yeah, it's yeah, and, and the Facebook. So, so it's not yeah, as, as Shamir was saying, it's not. First of all, it's not just Facebook adverts. But secondly, you you know, um, just because. You, so when you're looking at targeting in general, right? You don't actually target people who are going to vote for you anyway, right? That's not the point of targeting. So you don't use online targeting. If you're if you're leave, you don't use online targeting to target older people who don't look at ads online who are already going to vote for you. That's not the point. The the point of targeting is finding people who may support you but might not vote or definitely are going to vote but are sitting on the fence. You know, if I was to put it, you know, 
yeah. at a sort of base level. And so my, so, my answer, so, so, so my answer to that is that it's not that 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 yeah, absolutely, you know, more older people voted voted leave, um, but there were. But th that's not the point of online targeting, it's to find the people who aren't those people who you need to push or pull in some particular way. I'm holding Shamir's question. I have one last question here. I don't know, it's two. Uh, uh, what's yeah, your question, Nika? Uh, Peter's too sweet, but I'll answer the uh, actual question. Uh, given the email that I've had and directed and directly in both Trump and Brexit, uh, can we call this up a whistleblower, isn't it? Well, we did have this last week, okay. we did have this question. The question is, uh, maybe I'll let Chris answer it again, but I will repeat, because uh, you couldn't hear the mic, it, how can it, because he worked, Chris worked on Trump and Brexit, he created this disaster. Uh, how can he call himself a whistleblower? I had a, this question was asked, it's my chance to have a comment, because I'm sitting here all night. It was asked by a woman, uh, a lady last time, and she said, you're not like Daniel Ellsberg, you're not like Chelsea Manning, because you've got pink hair. And I went home and I had that, this read this and I had the brilliant answer. Hold on, Snowden worked for the NSA. Ellsberg worked for the Pentagon for radically shot weapons in, in Vietnam. The idea of whistleblower is kind of some nitty clean thing. But anyway, Chris, do you, I've answered. Well, why, why, yes. And that's, we'll come to, why, why have you come? Well, you've got pink hair. You should have said it sure. Yeah, the question is, so, why? So, why? <laughs> yeah. so the first thing that I'd say is that I think we should be encouraging people who know about Things to know about wrongdoing, even if they're involved in it, we should be encouraging those people to come. Yeah, to no matter how long. Secondly, um, I, you know, I didn't come forward because I got sued almost immediately after leaving, and I had to sign not just an NDA but an undertaking of confidence. Um, and you know, it is quite intimidating to, you know, <laughs> go up against Robert Mercer, who's a billionaire, right? Who who threatens to crush you. Um, the the other thing that I would, I would point out is that um, I didn't fully appreciate the impacts of what I helped create until 2016 happened. Um, so very soon. Very soon after that, like I started working with The Guardian originally as an anonymous source for a lot of Carol's reporting in the spring of last year, right? So, so Trump got elected in November, and within a couple of months, I was giving materials to, to The Guardian, in part because I, hadn't, I didn't see or really fully appreciate the impact of what I was doing until it had happened. Um, the other thing that I would say is that just because I'm coming out now doesn't mean that I haven't been working on this for months. I went to the authorities, I reported it, I reported myself, I reported Cambridge Analytica um, to the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, you know, we've reported this to the Electoral Commission and indeed the Cybercrime Unit of the National Crime Agency. Um, did that well before coming forward. What you're seeing is the, the, the climax of a process that has taken a year. Um, the other thing that I did is I went and talked to other people I know who were involved in various aspects of these programs to gather evidence to pass on to The Guardian, to The New York Times, and indeed to the UK authorities. That took months. That took months and months and months and months. And, and I promise you that was very difficult to do because when you go and talk to somebody who has been intimidated over and over and over again by a billionaire by Steve Bannon, it is hard to convince them to risk trusting trusting someone else with information that could be incredibly compromising to them and handing it over to journalists. Um, so the thing that I would say is that I'm coming out publicly now, but very shortly after Trump got elected, I started working with The Guardian and then started reporting uh, you know, the, these programs to the various UK authorities. So what you're seeing that this is the end of that, of that process is coming forward. But for me, it was really important to sort of make sure that if I'm going to come forward, I'm going to do it right um, and collect as much evidence as I can, give it first to the authorities so they have time to investigate, and then also you know, work with not just The Guardian, but getting The Guardian and The New York Times, these two rival papers, to then work together to make sure that you know, British people and Americans and more broadly people around the world know about that. So that took a lot of time. And you've not 75 billion of the share price, basically. You know, but that's not your point. Last word to Shamir. Um, it's, it's a similar question. And, and in a way, 
Chris is older than you, more experience, and probably there's been a more shocking experience for you. First, why did you, and when did this decide to come forward, and how do you feel now? You know, there wasn't one, people like to say that, you know, it's one eureka moment where you say, oh, now I'm going to, you know, go after that or whatever. But for me, it was a process. For me, it was a process of not just being Darren Grimes' confidant and sort of like, uh, and sort of conveying the same lines that both Eve staff members were telling us. But even for me, I was convinced that it was just remoning. You know, I was, I, I, from the BuzzFeed article, all we were told was, oh, they're just finding reasons to stop Brexit. They just can't believe that you're so amazing. Uh, and so me being an you know, egotistical graduate, I was like, yeah, you know, they're just finding a reason to um, uh, stop Brexit. And so the whole remoning, uh, the remoning sort of became consistent. And the lines we had were given by very intelligent people, by people who were successful in politics, <coughs> who are best friends with Michael Gove, Boris Johnson, who work for our cabinet ministers and our prime ministers. So like, uh, how am I, why, who in their right mind, being 22, 23, would be like, oh, these people are definitely lying. You know, you don't think that. And especially the kind of trust you put into people that run this country. You n you don't, you, you it's imp like, I wasn't able to come to the realization until I had slowly but surely disassociated myself, one, from them, as well as, like, go through the evidence and sort of go through my emails, like, talk, to, literally talk to myself and say, Shami, you know, there's a reason Darren is, is always so upset. Shami, there's, there's, you can't, like, there's something odd going on. And that's why, you know, when the, when the next electoral commission investigation was launched and Darren, you know, got increasingly worried, and then there was another one, and it was just sort of this consistent lashing out of the media, I was at first convinced it's just politics, because that's what I was told. You know, that's what my boyfriend at the time was saying, that it's just politics. You know, that's what Victoria Woodcock was saying. You know, it's just, they're finding excuses. Don't worry, don't worry. Here's the lines you have to take. Here's what you have to respond to the Electoral Commission. Just say this, 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 and that was that. And we, Darren and I, were like, this is the process. This is okay. So it's been a, it's been a very long and grueling process of me reflecting and think, and having to tell myself, Shamir, it wasn't remoning, it was wrong. It was, you know, it was, it was illegal, you were coordinating. And the line that we took was that we, there was no coordination. And I just said to myself, you know, I've been saying to myself, Shami, you, you were coordinating. Shami, you were coming to the office. You were sitting in that office and, and working on that desk. But this is how much influence these people have on, <coughs> on young people, you know, on uh, Darren, on me. But uh, luckily, thank God, you know, Carol Cadwallader's article, first article sort of, you know, I, I would say it sparked uh, the sort of, oh, this is really, Odd. This is weird. This is weird. I'm involved in this, and then get, you know, speaking to Chris, and then sort of going through the Google Drive and seeing, and, and I don't know again what reasons she would do this. Seeing the chief operations officer remove the campaign director and remove the digital director of Vote Leave from the shared BD Drive. What else am I supposed to think about? Oh, okay, something is pretty odd. So it was truth. It was evidence that persuaded. Yeah, and it was evidence, and it was you know seeing Darren constantly get worse and worse. And, and sort of telling, and I, I remember, I've sold down so many times, I'd say, why aren't they helping you? Why isn't VL doing anything? Why isn't Bodif sort of helping you get by this? But it was, you know, crickets, leave, leave it, Darren, it's okay. It doesn't matter, they're just trying to attack you, they're finding a reason to attack you. So in a way you feel that Darren particularly now, who has not come forward, has been left, left to hang out to draw. Yeah, and I don't, and I, anyone in Darren's position would be in the exact same position. When you have, when your friends are the people sort of involved with some of the most important politicians in this country and when you're so constantly involved with these people who are reminding you again and again nothing was wrong let's take back control you know even at this point you know tweeting about it when it's not your place to be tweeting about the law um, it's the authorities place but you know th this is bigger you know Chris has already said this but this is bigger than Brexit you, you there are two young volunteers have been used to cheat you know, it's like, uh, frankly, and I've said this before, like I vote leave, but I, I don't care about that right now. Right now, all I care about is having a, a fair system, a democratic system. Like this country values, like I've, I, you know, I've even mentioned this before, but this country values queuing. 
is the most important thing to, you know, as, as someone who grew up in Pakistan and moved here when I was 15, this country provided me with things that Pakistan could never, security, safety, belief in a system that works, and belief in a system that is, that is just. And to go through this process and see that, that, and see that sort of security I had and belief in this country that I had just sort of slowly stripped away and like uh, doubting the integrity of, of, of our democracy has p brought me to this stage where I, you know, where I've gone through possibly the worst thing, uh, you know, a gay Muslim man can go through. Um, you think it's worth it for those values of democracy? Well, you know, that's up to the British people. You know, like, I, I, I don't know. I hope it is, but like after you know today going on uh, the news and like you know unfortunately I you know I go through comments and tweets and just sort of seeing the kind of vitriol the, the, that's don't go through the tweets. I know but you know it's it's it's, it's not it's not just bots it's, it's not bots, bots. Okay, it's no. it's journalists it's politicians oh, it's our foreign secretary you know it's these people that are it's uh, Downing Street yeah D Downing Street you're being trolled by Downing Street literally. And so, you know, I, I don't care about how they portray me. For me, it's, it's just now I've, I'm very much focused on the evidence is there, and the evidence is actually there. Like, just to be clear, you can all see it for yourself on fairboard.uk. Um, every single bit of evidence I've sort of put out and left to the British people. Because I've said, I've done, I've done my part. I've, I've, I've thrown away everything that I've built over the past two years. I've thrown away, thrown away the people that I, that I have loved and cared about, but that have used me, or seemingly that I thought I cared about, but who have obviously used me in this process, as well as used Darren in this process, just to win. And that's not something this country, in my opinion, should stand for. It doesn't matter whether you're a Lever or, or a Remainer. And I think, you know, as, and I, 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 the reason why I keep saying I would vote Leave again is because, like, this country, there is a variety of reasons people vote Leave, and people, you know, go on this whole like argument about why leaving is bad and why remaining is bad etc but that's that's not the point anymore the point now is that there people have cheated and people have been used and there is strong evidence a 40 page like you know I don't know 46 page dossier of just evidence for people the to see analysis the, the actual evidence is three binders yeah it? exactly that's and you know and, and so uh, people so people can decide for themselves like so I, you stuck up for the rule of law a great British man and so we now rely it on making sure the rule of law happens. So, I mean, I, I think these two guys will deserve a massive round of applause yeah. for just... <laughs>